Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. Welcome to Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host. Uh, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour, I'm going to be talking about some things in the news that I think are important and that are worthy of your attention. Um, if you have any comments, questions, reactions, whatever to the show, you can email me. The email address is whoviating, W H O V I A T I N G, at AOL.com, uh, or you can go to my website, which is Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and you can leave a comment there or you can get an email, uh, get the email from there. If you do email me, as always, I ask just two things. One, include something in the subject line to make it clear this is not spam, of which I get way too much. And uh, two, uh, be a little patient about getting an answer because I just am very slow about keeping in touch by email, but you will get an answer. All right, with all of that out of the way, let's get to it. I want to start, as I always like to whenever I possibly can, with uh, some kind of good news. Uh, and the first bit of good news actually involves something I can't really tell you about because it's going to happen the day after I do this. So uh, for me it's in the future, but it'll have already happened by the time you see it. It's a labor action. On Thursday, September 4th, workers at places like McDonald's, Wendy's, and KFC are, uh, will have staged a one-day strike, a protest one-day walkout, as part of an ongoing campaign to secure a living wage for people in the fast food industry. Uh, according to Fight for 15, which is the group that's organizing these actions, strikes will take place in more than 100 cities on the 4th, and some of those actions are to include nonviolent civil disobedience like sit-ins uh, in order to dramatize the importance of the issue. Uh, and what's more, by the way, in this case, unlike the previous demonstrations, there are also going to be some thousands of home health care workers who are also going to be taking part in this in solidarity. The 15 in Fight for 15 refers to the idea of a wage of $15 an hour, a living wage. Uh, the other major demand of the campaign is for the right of these workers to uh, organize a union without facing retribution for trying to do so. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the average hourly wage for restaurant workers in May of 2013 was $8.74 an hour, which is not a living wage. The strikes began with just 200 workers in New York City in November 2012, but uh, in the two years since, they've occurred every few months now. Uh, the gains for those people working in the industry have been modest so far, but it has made a demonstrable, recognizable impact in keeping the issue of a minimum wage alive in the public mind. Uh, as an example of that, uh, this year, beginning of this year, 13 states increased their minimum wage by an average of 28 cents an hour. Uh, other increases in other states that are already scheduled to go into effect will be coming. Uh, and more recently, and perhaps more significantly than that, in July, the National Labor Relations Board ruled that McDonald's and its franchisees are jointly responsible for violations of wage and labor laws and standards that are committed by those franchisees. The corporations have always insisted that they bear no responsibility whatsoever for what the franchises do. Now they can't say that anymore. The strikers are being supported by the uh, Service Employees International Union, the SEIU. So what we've got is fed up workers demanding justice and taking it to the streets to that end. Now that, that's good news. All right, another bit of good news, sort of, you know, well, take it where you can, good news. Last year, the Texas legislature, which has become so frothingly reactionary that even Molly Ivins would not have been able to find an amusing tale to tell, uh, last year it passed some of the worst anti-choice, anti-women's freedoms bills in the country. The bill requires abortion doctors to have admitting privileges in a nearby hospital and required that all procedures take place in a surgical facility, that is, one that meets hospital-level standards. Those are requirements made of no other clinics of any sort anywhere in the state. Another part of the bill, uh, passed by people who in another context would be screaming about the horrors of a government takeover of health care, uh, actually limit when and where physicians can prescribe medications that uh, can induce an, a natural abortion. Uh, in March, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals over 
overturned a district court decision and upheld several of those restrictions in what Planned Parenthood called a terrible ruling. All right, so where's the good news? Well, it's a case of take it where you can find it, but here it is. On August 29th, District Judge Lee Yackel sided with critics who were going after a part of that law which was not involved in the previous decision, the requirement that clinics meet hospital level standards, including operating rooms and air filtration systems. These are excessively stringent demands, unnecessary demands, that would have left just seven such clinics in the entire state of Texas, population 26 million. The previous decision by the Fifth Circuit upholding those other parts of the law had already forced the closing of more than a dozen clinics. This requirement would force the closing of 18 more. As a result, Yackel found that, quoting, the overall effect of the provisions is to create an impermissible obstacle as applied to all women seeking a pre-viability abortion. Now, this victory may be short-lived. Yackel was also the judge whose decision striking down the other parts of the law was overturned by the Fifth Circuit uh, as part of this exercise in back to 1900 ideology. But like I said, with good news, it's often take it where you can find it. And in this case, at least we know that those who believe in a woman's right to choose have not given up. Now we have two uh, updates. They're actually linked updates. Linked updates. Uh, the first one comes in the form of a reminder. On Monday, September 1st, U.S. military forces carried out an attack in Somalia targeted against the, militis, uh, uh, the militant Islamist group called Al-Shabaab. Now, in an unusual move, the Pentagon acknowledged these attacks, uh, but it gave no details. Still, according to journalists in Somalia, the attack consisted of a drone missile attack near the port of uh, Barawi, which is an Al-Shabaab stronghold in Somalia. Now, the reminder here is that this was not the first such covert U.S. military operation in Somalia. In October 2013, the Pentagon deployed a small team of advisors to Mogadishu, which is the capital of Somalia, supposedly to coordinate operations with troops from the African Union, which were there to fight against al-Shabaab. These advisors almost immediately got into a firefight with the militants during a house raid. Since then, U.S. commandos have conducted raids and operations in Somalia, uh, raids and operations the military has done its best to keep secret. Okay, so here's the update here. Does anyone recall any congressional authorization for any of this? Or is this, as it appears to be, yet another case of Mr. Nobel Peace Prize president figuring he can do anything he wants with the military and he don't need no stinking authorization? The thing is, don't try to use the, the AUMF, the Authorization to Use Military Force, which is the basis for the wars in Iraq and, and the war, and wars in Pakistan. Um, that's been used, that AUMF has been used in the past to justify attacks on groups that are affiliated with Al-Qaeda. You can't really rely on that because as far back as May 2013, the amazing Mr. O himself called that provision outdated. So, where's the authorization? Or do I again have to ask, Mr. President, just who the hell do you think you are? Or maybe instead I should ask when we will see the covert actions in Ukraine? Or is that a different story? Because like the other places where we conduct our limited air strikes and our secret drone wars, in the case of Ukraine, we'd be dealing with people who actually can shoot back. Our, our related, our linked update, however, is that last week I gave the Clown Award to the War Hawks, particularly those in Congress, for loudly and repeatedly insisting that Obama do something about ISIS while refusing to offer any suggestions or proposals as to what that something might actually be. In other words, they want to be on record with strong talk, but not in any way that involves them taking any responsibility. Well, guess what? This week they were still at it. Representative Mike Rogers, who heads the House Intelligence Committee, said Obama's foreign policy is an absolute freefall. 
Meanwhile, his equivalent in the Senate, Senator Dianne Feinstein, said Obama is too cautious in his approach to dealing with ISIS, and both offered dire predictions of attacks on the United States and Europe if ISIS is not crushed with Rogers actually raising the specter of hundreds of ISIS-trained Americans returning home to wreak havoc. John McCain kept up his barrage of Sunday morning news appearances, uh, demanding fast action to not just contain but outright defeat ISIS, echoed by Representative Peter King, who said, the longer we wait, the more dangerous it becomes. Not one of these people offered any hint of what it is, again, that something to be done actually should be. It was a massive course of do something, just don't ask me what. So in a way, I guess the linkage here is that maybe I shouldn't be surprised that Obama figures he can do whatever he wants with the military, since that pretty much seems to be exactly what Congress is telling him. All right, one last thing before we go to break, and this is something that easily could have been the outrage of the week. Here's the story. In July of 2012, when Thomas DiCarlo Calloway, better known as musician and singer CeeLo Green, was having dinner with a 33-year-old woman, he slipped a drug, supposed to have been ecstasy, into her drink, a fact that he acknowledged in a documented phone call he later made. The next thing she remembers, she says, is waking up in her bed in her hotel room, naked, next to Green. Now, prosecutors did not file any complaints of sexual assault, citing lack of evidence, which is, after all, the point of using drugs in a case like this, because there's not later evidence. Green did admit to having sexual contact. He just insisted, surprise, that it was all consensual. Well, even so, despite this, Green was charged with one felony count of giving her the drug. And here's where you get to the outrageous part. At a preliminary hearing on August 29th, Green pleaded no contest to the charge. Now, technically, the plea is nolo contender, which translates to, I do not contest the charges. It's a way of allowing the accused to offer no defense while not actually admitting guilt. Now, I think in terms of potential penalties, this has legally the same effect as a guilty plea or a conviction. The penalties are the same as if you were convicted. Okay, so what was his punishment? Now, remember, to be a felony, a crime has to have a sentence that, that allows for a sentence of at least a year and a day in prison. So what did Green get? for drugging a woman, leaving her either unconscious or so stoned as to be incapacitated, then having sex with her under conditions which by any sane definition would constitute rape? He got three years probation. He was ordered to do 360 hours of community service and attend 52 Alcoholics or Narcotics Anonymous meetings, and along with paying some restitution to his victim. We continue to refuse. We continue to fail to take violence against women seriously. Despite all that's in front of us, despite all that we have seen, despite all that we have heard, we still won't take it seriously. I mean, Cito Green certainly doesn't. In, in a series of tweets after he avoided the slammer, he bizarrely claimed that, quoting him, if someone is passed out, they're not even with you consciously. So with implies consent. Women who have really been raped, remember. And so it seems we're back to legitimate rape, where with implies consent, and not remembering it means it didn't happen. An online petition, a campaign in response to the tweets demanding that his new show, The Good Life, be canceled, got more than 30,000 signatures in less than three hours. On September 1st, Green took to Twitter again to apologize. Uh, what he actually said was, I'm quoting, I sincerely apologize for my comments being taken so far out of context. It's Twitter. It's 140 characters. What is the broader context from which this was taken? Happily, that sort of lame non-apology did not help his cause. Neither did the fact that he not only deleted the original tweets, he deleted the apology as well. The next day, September 2nd, TBS and Time Warner canceled The Good Life, which may be the best thing to come out of this whole thing, actual consequences. You know, one final thought about this. 
As part of his non-apology, Green declared, quoting, I'd never condone the harm of any women. Which, and this is the thing, in his own mind, that might even be true. He might think of what he did as not involving harm. Because we will not take violence against women seriously. Let's take a break. And we're back. Uh, okay, this is why CeeLo Green got outright. This is the outrage of the week. Last week, I said that the big good news of the week was the unlimited ceasefire uh, that was reached between Israel and Hamas, putting at least a temporary end to the bloodshed in Gaza. And yes, yes, I know that Gaza was not the only place where blood was shed. Yes, I know. But so much of the blood was shed there that it's reasonable to describe it this way. Over 2,100 Palestinians, most all of them civilians, were killed in the fighting, as opposed to 71 Israelis, 65 of who were soldiers. Anyway, how bad is it in Gaza now? According to a new report by Shelter Cluster, this is a, an international organization that uh, is involved in assessing post-conflict uh, uh, reconstruction. According to uh, Shelter Cluster, unless Israel stops blockading the import of concrete and other building materials into Gaza, it will take 20 years to rebuild the Strip's battered housing stock, and that figure does not include rebuilding from the damage that has been done by Israeli attacks. Uh, Shelter Cluster actually is chaired by the Norwegian Refugee Council and acts uh, with the participation of the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, the UN's refugee agency, uh, and the Red Cross. Uh, according to the assessment by Shelter Cluster, some 17,000 Gaza housing units were destroyed or severely damaged during this summer's war, and 5,000 more still need work from the results of previous wars. Uh, and uh, in addition, Gaza has a housing deficit of over 75,000 units. In short, there are scores of thousands of people in Gaza without proper shelter. In light of that, what does Israel do? It steals land on the West Bank. On August 31st, Israel announced the biggest land seizure in the occupied territories in over 30 years. Nearly 1,000 acres in the Et Zion Jewish settlement near, uh, near Bethlehem were summarily declared state land by the bogusly named civil administration, bogus because it's actually run by the Israeli military. The military gave no reason for the land theft, but Israel Radio said this step was taken in response to the kidnapping and killing of three Jewish teenagers by, by Hamas militants in June. That's the incident that actually led to the rapidly soaring tensions and cycle of violence that led to the, to the outbreak of the latest war. Which means, of course, that Israel's response to all this is to decide the best way to deal with it is to take an outrageously provocative response in the very same area that started the trouble in the first place. Yeah, that makes sense. Israel has condemned around the world for its settlements on the West Bank, which are illegal under international law. Uh, plus, it's actually been condemned uh, by a number of places around the world for this latest land seizure. Uh, the U.S., the United Kingdom, um, Japan, the European Union, the U.N. Secretary General were among those. Uh, Turkey did it, Norway did it, there are other places that have done it that condemned Israel's uh, seizure of land and urged it to reverse this decision. The Israeli peace group Peace Now said the appropriation was meant to turn a site where 10 families now live adjacent to a Jewish seminary into a permanent settlement. But the Israeli government claims, oh no, 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 we're not expanding settlements. This is not a new settlement because this site has actually been officially designated as a neighborhood of an existing settlement several miles away. I wonder if the government's media person managed to keep a straight face in reporting that. A local Palestinian mayor said the Palestinians actually own the land that's been seized. They've been harvesting their olive trees on them, but that's never made a difference in the past, in past land seizures, so why should it matter now? Uh, Nabil Abu Radena 
who is a spokesman for Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas, uh, called on Israel to cancel the seizure, saying, quoting, this decision will lead to more instability. This will only inflame the situation after the war in Gaza. Now, such statements are very unlikely to sway Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who broke off talks with Abbas in April after Abbas reached a reconciliation deal with Hamas, and who, that is Netanyahu, declared in the wake of the ceasefire that Israel would not resume talks with Abbas until he breaks ties with Hamas. Even though a Fatah Hamas coalition government would mean Hamas participating in a government that openly recognizes the state of Israel, which would mean of necessity Hamas having to tone down at least its anti Israel rhetoric and very likely would reduce the chances of renewed rocket attacks coming out of Gaza. Why wouldn't Israel want that? Why wouldn't Israel want developments that, by their very nature, would lead to the at least partial moderation of Hamas? Well, bluntly, I suspect it's because of what I've maintained for some time. Israel does not want peace. Or, more exactly, the, the right-wing fanatics whose coalition dominates the national government of Israel does not want peace. They do not want a settlement. They do not want an actual end to the conflict, or again, more exactly, an end to the conflict which does not involve the total subjugation of the Palestinians. But consider this. The platform of the Likud party, the party of Benjamin Netanyahu, this is his party, several years ago said in its party platform, quoting now, the Jordan River will be the permanent eastern border of the state of Israel. Now, when you look at this map of the West Bank, you see down where the Dead Sea is, and you see that river flowing into the Dead Sea from the north. That's the Jordan River. So what they're saying is, what Likud is saying is, the entire West Bank is Israel. Quoting again from that platform, Jerusalem is the eternal united capital of the state of Israel and only of Israel. The government will reject Palestinians' proposals to divide Jerusalem. The government of Israel flatly rejects the establishment of a Palestinian Arab state west of the Jordan River. The Jewish communities in Judea, Samaria, and Gaza are the realization of Zionist values. And settlement of the land is a clear expression of the unassailable right of the Jewish people to the land of Israel, which again, by definition, they say, includes all of the West Bank. Now that pl platform has been modified somewhat since uh, 2005 when Israel withdrew its uh, settlements from Gaza. But the Likud party has never, in any of its statement of principles, accepted the notion of a Palestinian state. In fact, as recently as mid-July, Netanyahu declared that Israel will, quote, never relinquish security control over the territory west of the River Jordan. That is, in other words, he can envision that there could be a Palestinian state, provided it's a disarmed, defenseless vassal of Israel. And this is nothing new. This is nothing new. In a recently discovered video from 2001, Netanyahu was talking to a group of Israeli West Bank settlers at a time that he actually thought the camera was off. In the video, he boasted about, this, about derailing the Oslo peace process. He described American foreign policy as easily manipulated and said the only way to deal with Palestinians was, quote, beat them up, not once, but repeatedly, beat them up so it hurts so badly until it's unbearable. He also said that the U.S. will make statements, but that it won't do anything. It won't, he said, interfere with us, which actually is spot on. And it explains why the statements from the State Department about the land grab, which urged Israel to reverse the decision and called it counterproductive, will have no effect on Israeli policy because they will no more be followed by any actual actions, such as cutting off military aid to Israel, than any of the previous statements over the years have. So Israel celebrates a ceasefire in Gaza by refusing to negotiate with the Palestinian Authority, stealing land in the West Bank for illegal settlements, and avoiding any possibility of a long-term settlement while pursuing its dreams of a greater Israel involving taking all of the West Bank. And the U.S. responds by harumphing and tisking and doing nothing. And that certainly qualifies as an outrage. All right last for today. That slides over. The outrage slides over rather smoothly into our other regular weekly feature. This is the Clown Award. 
given as always for meritorious stupidity. This week we have a double winner. It's a shared award. This week the big red nose goes to Senators Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders for defending the right of Israel to bomb hospitals and schools. At a local town hall meeting in Barnstable, uh, Warren was criticized for her vote in favor, recent vote, in favor of $225 million in military aid to Israel. Warren defended herself by saying, and this is a quote, America has a very special relationship with Israel. Israel lives in a very dangerous part of the world, and a part of the world where there aren't many liberal democracies. She also said Hamas attacks indiscriminately and referred to them as terrorists while saying that civilian casualties are the last thing Israel wants. And when pressed about that, she said that Hamas uses civilians as human shields and Israel has a right to defend itself. Okay, here's my question. Is there a single original thought anywhere in there? Is there a single thought in that whole thing which was not lifted from an Israeli government press release? During the most recent war, Israel shelled schools and hospitals on the grounds that rockets and militants were located nearby. Not in the schools and hospitals, although apparently there were two cases where Hamas stored rockets in a school. But the thing is, these I'm not saying they're in the schools and hospitals, not on the schools and hospitals, but near the schools and hospitals. Which means, first, so much for the precision attacks Israel is always claiming to make. And as I mentioned before, the Gaza Strip has roughly the same population density, just about the same population density, as Boston. Just how far away from a civilian target could any military unit actually get? Even more to the point, the Geneva Convention on the Protection of Civilian Persons in Time of War prohibits attacks on hospitals, quoting, unless they are used to commit outside the humanitarian duties acts harmful to the enemy. Even under those circumstances, civilian hospitals can only be attacked, quote, after due warning has been giving, given, naming in all appropriate cases a reasonable time limit, and after such warning has remained unheeded, unquote. But for Elizabeth Warren, Simply having a military asset somewhere close to a hospital makes shelling that hospital legitimate self-defense, provided it is that it's Israel doing the shelling. And um, when he was asked about the idea of control, uh, when Warren was asked about the idea of conditioning future U.S. aid on a halt to more settlements in the West Bank. Settlements which, again, are illegal under international law and which U.S. policy recognizes as illegal under international law and has done so for years. When asked about conditioning U.S. aid on an end to these illegal settlements, Warren said, I think there's a question of whether we should go that far without giving any notion to what, just how far it is we actually should go. For his part, Bernie Sanders got into a testy and even heated exchange with some cons uh, constituents at a recent town meeting over his defense of Israel. Sanders supposedly ended on a note of resignation. He said, this is a very depressing and difficult issue. This has gone on for 60 bloody years. If you're asking me, do I have a magical solution? I don't. And you know, you know what? I very much doubt that you do. Well, yeah, I will say the truth is I don't have a magical solution. But a good start would be for people to stop saying that it must be okay because Israel did it. In other words, stop being clowns. That's it for this week. We're going to get out of here. Um, and for the moment, then, I'll, I'll tell you we'll be back next week with more doom and gloom and hopefully good news as well. But for the moment, you just have the best week you possibly can. All right? Peace.